Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is the second episode of Digital Salon, which is a new event series of the Goethe Institute New York and our executive director, Dr. Jörg Schumacher. And the idea, as Alta just said, is to bring you, a global audience, into contact with leading thinkers, writers, artists, uh, around a variety of topics taken from contemporary Germany. Uh, my name is Dean Whiteside, and we're happy to welcome uh, two wonderful established literary translators and longtime friends of the Goethe Institute New York, Alta L. Price and Tess Lewis, and also Duncan Lean, who's a young and upcoming translator, uh, who is the winner of this year's Goethe Kunst Prize for Young Translators. So congratulations, Duncan. Uh, today's episode is called Translating Cultural Identity, uh, and we're going to delve into the interesting and tense terrain which translation occupies uh, in enabling transmission across cultures. Uh, and language, you know, never takes place in a vacuum, but it's always deeply connected to, embedded within culture. Uh, and every culture, whether it's, you know, Victorian England or contemporary Germany, has implicit assumptions about race, gender, belonging, uh, in short, identity. So today's discussion will center around this novel, Ich bin Özlem by Dilek Gungwa. Uh, and this is a, a powerful and very personal novel about a young woman of Turkish heritage who's living in Berlin and uh, struggling with problems of racism in both subtle and quite blatant uh, forms within Germany's uh, majority society. So I'd like to take a moment now to introduce our uh, wonderful guests. Uh, Alta L. Price is in fact a former recipient of the Gute Kunst Prize. She translates from Italian and German into English and her acclaimed literary translations include uh, Dana Grigorsia's An Instinctive Feeling of Innocence and coming out now uh, Anna Goldenberg's book, I Belong to Vienna, A Jewish Family's Story of Exile and Return, published by New Vessel Press. Uh, then Tess Lewis is a writer and translator from French and German. She's been awarded numerous grants and prizes, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, and she's made acclaimed translations by authors such as Maya Hadelap, Walter Benjamin, and Peter Handke. And finally, uh, Duncan Lean, uh, is the winner of the 2020 Goethe Kunst Prize, is a third year PhD candidate in comparative literature at Penn State University. Uh, and he specializes in transnational German literature with a focus on German Turkish literary relations. And he's also published on Turkish uh, Albanian literary encounters. So uh, welcome to you three. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, where are you and uh, how are you doing? I'll jump in. Uh, so I am in Chicago and all things considered, I'm doing quite well. Uh, Dean, I wanna thank you and the entire Go um, Goethe Institute for having us today. And um, just uh, apropos of you asking me where I am, I used to live in New York. So when I got the Goethe Kunst seven years ago, I was living in New York and I left a large part of my heart and soul there. Um, but the interesting part about Chicago that I think sort of that connects with some of the conversation that we're going to have around translation and cultural transmission later on today is that I want to point out that the, the name of the city of Chicago is from the Miami, Illinois language, um, Chicawa. And it's variously translated as wild onion or wild garlic. Um, and sometimes uh, I've seen it in other texts translated as stinky onion or stinky garlic. So that's an odd little small world moment that connects very concretely with the text that um, Duncan so deftly brought into English for us today. Brilliant. And I'm in um, Westchester, just north of the city. Um, I kind of, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm grateful for that. Um, sometimes um, being freelance and a translator, it feels like I've been in quarantine or self-isolation for about 25 years. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's been a challenging time for any number of reasons. And one of them is the fact that uh, being on the Guttekunst jury for five years now, one of my favorite things about the prize was the ceremony where we got to meet the, um, the prize winner. And 
um, also the translation community would always turn out um, in a respectable number and show their support and interest in each other's works, regardless of language pairs. And I'm sorry we're missing that this year, but I do hope, Duncan, that you'll be able to come in the future to events at the Goethe Institute New York. And thank you also, Dean and the Goethe Institute, the new director for continuing to support this prize, um, which is uh, prizes for emerging translators in the United States are very rare. And I think it plays an important role um, in increasing the translation community, but also in spreading the love of German language literature. So thank you for that as well. And I'm in State College, Pennsylvania. I'm doing well, uh, enjoying being with everyone today. Thank you for organizing it. Uh, it's, I, I would hope to, to be able to attend some events in person, of course, one day, but it's great that there are now more opportunities, it seems like the digital salons, and hopefully that will continue as well so that um, those of us in provincial backwaters like central Pennsylvania can continue to, to be in contact with, with these kind of ideas and, and events. So glad Thank to you, be Duncan. Here. Uh, so uh, just, just a little bit for you, our audience, how this will work today will go for one hour until uh, four o'clock New York time. Uh, and at some point, we would love to hear your voices uh, and we could activate uh, your microphones. Uh, that being said, if you look at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side, you'll see a button that says Q&A or F und A if it's in German. Uh, please type your questions into that Q&A box throughout the conversation, and then we'll uh, sort of cherry pick some ones and we can unmute your microphone at the end. So when you ask the question, uh, have your microphone ready because we'd love to, to hear you also. And we'll, we'll do that probably in the last 10 or 15 minutes or so of, of today's discussion. Uh, I'll say a little bit about the Goethe Kunst Prize. In 2010, the Goethe Institute New York received a generous donation in memory of Frederick and Grace Goethe Kunst, uh, and a prize was created to identify outstanding young translators of German literature into English and to assist them in establishing contact with the uh, translation and publishing communities. And as of 2017, the prize is supported by the Friends of Goethe New York. Uh, and we're grateful to the Friends of Goethe New York for their continued support of this prize. Uh, the Goethe Kunst Prize of the Friends of Goethe New York is open to college students and to all translators under the age of 35 uh, who've not yet published a book length uh, translation. Uh, and it's you know, it's an interesting journey, as I'm sure Alta, uh, our judge, will explain uh, of receiving what are anonymous numbers on a page and out of that uh, bringing uh, these young translators into the limelight as Alta, in fact, won the prize uh, several years ago. So uh, it's 310 now and I'll turn it over to you, Alta, for the uh, rest of our discussion. Sure, thank you so much, Dean. Um, and I, I also really appreciate the, the fact that uh, this year we're able to still celebrate the Goethe Kunst and broaden the conversation. So um, folks in the audience, please do feel free. If questions come up as we're speaking, you know, feel free to send them in and we'll, we'll address them in the Q&A &Q at the end. Um, you know, the Goethe Kunst is near and dear to my heart. When I, uh, I entered completely on a lark, I had done a lot of nonfiction um, and uh, criticism work, but very little literary translation. And I found those worlds are somewhat separate. And this particular prize is very special in that it really supports emerging translators. Um, and as Dean mentioned, the, the blind nature of it is fabulous. I'm sure it's a lot of work for the, for the librarians at, at the Goethe Institute behind the scenes to anonymize all of these, but it's just a trip to be on the jury. Um, so in 2013, when I got my notice, I, I thought, oh, surely they got the wrong number. It, I, my piece couldn't have won, but it did. And it, it, um, it was just a wonderful opportunity. It's how I met Tess Lewis, who is a fellow juror of mine. I also want to point out that um, Farah Strauss and Giroux editor uh, Jeremy Davies was our, our third um, juror. So all of us read these these pieces, and we, you know, we conferred and, but we were basing it solely on numbers, um, uh, codes, you know. 
So I, I mentioned that because um, it's, it's really open, you know, below that age. So 90 some people requested the text this year. And this was not, um, I don't want to say whether it was a hard or an easy text. I don't know that you can really put a label on things like that. Um, there are different ways of approaching translation. Uh, and oftentimes I find that the texts that look the simplest on the first read present many, many challenges. So of those 90 some requests, 34 um, translators sent in submissions. Um, and one of the most fun parts of being on the jury is looking at different aspects of these samples because they are all of the same exact text and seeing the different solutions that different translators came up with. So I think that's all I really wanna say about that right now. Um, we have a lot to talk about. Um, I know that both um, my work on Donna Grigorcha's An Instinctive Feeling of Innocence, Tessa's work on Maya Hodorloff's Angel of Oblivion, and Melinda Najabonji's um, novels uh, cross these cultural borders. All of these, these writers are writing in German um, and investigating how the German language and culture intersect with other cultures and identities. So I would like to simply pass the mic now to this year's winner, Duncan, and um, you know, your, your piece uh, did really stood out and I am excited to hear your reading. And if you also wanna say a few words about your experience specifically um, with the German Turkish, some of these cultural tensions that are, that come up in this book. Um, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's a true honor for me to have been selected as the 2020 Gunikos Prize winner. And I'd like to thank Dean for organizing the event, Alta and Tess, and everyone else who's taken the time to be here today. Uh, it's, as, as has already been mentioned, I have a background with Turkish German literature in general, but actually working, translating the text in Oslem, or I am Oslem, uh, was especially rewarding for me because one of my first encounters with German Turkish literature was another novel by the same author, Dilek Günger, Das Geheimnis meiner Türkischen Großmutter, The Secret of My Turkish Grandmother. And so working on this text uh, was rewarding on its own. It had a number of challenges uh, in it, which we'll discuss more later. Uh, but it also came with the sense of having come full circle in some way that, that working around back to this same author who really in, in, in a very real sense put me on the, the trajectory I'm on today intellectually. Uh, I've had other experiences interpreting and translating both from Turkish and German, primarily in non-literary context, but I've always enjoyed coming back to literary text enjoyed, that I've enjoyed reading and, and tinkering with with the translation problems they raise. Uh, it has, it's had a value in the process of language learning for me, but also as a form of close reading, of course, translation offers really an unparalleled view under the hood of the text. Uh, and so this, this individual process of translation has always been important for me, but of course, uh, when we speak of translation, it implies an act of sharing. And so the opportunity to be able to share this work today uh, is, has really been the most exciting part of the Gutekunst Prize for me. And I'm grateful and happy to be here with you. Das Geheimnis meiner Türkischen Großmutter, The Secret of My Turkish Grandmother, the, the earlier novel by Günther that I mentioned, uh, brought my attention to the variety of migrant and post-migrant experiences amongst Germans and the fact that Germany emphatically is a nation of immigration, as was long denied. Uh, in the text I am Uslam, we see that Germany and German literature, including, of course, other the other German-speaking countries, uh, are not monolingual. Uh, they really never were, but there's, there's no denying the diversity of German literature today and, of course, the wider understandings of what uh, it means to be German. Uh, this may appears slightly cliched or, or is already an accomplished fact for many of us gathered here today. Uh, but as the novel compellingly shows, there's, there's always this need to continue to assert these truths and push back against all the forms of, of stereotyping and racism which continue to be a routine experience for so many in German speaking countries. We see this reflected 
in Uslam's story, and it will likely remind many of the situation we're confronted with in the US and which has come to a head in the past few weeks that we're called to continue to deconstruct and transcend the pervasive forms of racial oppression in our societies. My encounter with Gunger's text uh, was a first step, as I said, on a journey that began with Turkish settlement in Germany, but has taken me far beyond this. Uh, as, as Dean mentioned, I've also worked with Turkish literature, Turk Turkish-Albanian literary relations. Uh, and uh, this, this goes back to, to my undergrad years following reading this text as a freshman at the University of Georgia. Uh, I began learning Turkish and eventually moved there in 2011 and I lived uh, in Turkey for several years. My knowledge of Turkish and status as an intimate outsider, although I'm not sure this, this term is always the right one, uh, is, is relevant to some aspects of the translation today that I'll be sharing with you, but it's also prompted me to think of translation in much broader terms. It's not just a writing process, but in my view also related to being in multiple languages, places, and cultures. For this reason, I'm often hesitant uh, about the trope that the translator is a mediator or, or the idea of bridging different cultures uh, because it assumes that they're already distinct entities that are in need of some kind of extra connection. As much as translation involves finding solutions to expressions which don't have a direct equivalent or don't appear at least to have a direct equivalent, it also requires the translator to identify and leverage the overlaps between languages. And ultimately, each act of translation is a small contribution to expanding these spaces where multiple affiliations uh, can, can flourish and where exclusionary identities break down. This is all very relevant in Ikhvin Uslam or I am Uslam. Uh, and I think this will be apparent in the excerpt that I've chosen to present today. One of the things that won't come up in this excerpt, but which struck me uh, on my first reading of the text was the use of Turkish in it. Uh, and so it's, it's presented untranslated, but glossed. Uh, and so, of course, because of my own personal interest, this was striking and, and uh, really uh, an early focus of my attention, but in the translation process, it quickly became apparent that these weren't the most significant translation challenges, uh, that, that the, the presence of multiple languages was a natural part of the text. Uh, and since it's not being translated into Turkish, there was really no, no need for me to, to, to tinker with this. And this is related to a final point I'd like to make that as much as I've emphasized the German-Turkish aspect of this text, it would be a disservice, I think, to, to exclusively read Günger or any of the other uh, many authors active in the German-Turkish literary scene uh, as one-dimensional writers focused on the sole issue. There's so much more in this text and the excerpt uh, I've chosen will make this clear that, that although having Turkish parents, Turkish heritage, is a key question for Islam and very much an important concern in this text. It speaks to a much broader range of uh, problems related to identity and, and being with others in, in the societies we have today. Uh, so I will now read from the first few pages of my translation and then uh, we'll move on to what I think will be a really engaging and productive discussion about some of the issues in this text. Der Geruch vom geschmorten Fleisch hängt warm und schwer in der Luft. Meine Kleider, meine Haut, alles an mir riecht nach Fett und angebratenen Zwiebeln. Bevor die Gäste kommen, werde ich duschen, dass mir das noch immer nachgeht. Sometimes I catch myself raising my sleeve to my nose, sniffing my T-Shirt, my hair. I do it in the middle of the day, just because. My T-Shirt doesn't smell bad, neither do my armpits. The only scents are deodorant and warm skin. But what if I stink and just don't smell it? The first time I'm surprised at myself. I was going to work, my hair still wet from the shower. Passing by the mailboxes in the entryway, I stood still, pulled a handful of t-shirts under my nose and breathed in. Orange body wash, detergent, everything's okay. It's been almost 30 years, but the fear I might stink remains. Luckily, nobody on the school bus ever called me a dirty turk or a garlic muncher which would have been incorrect in any case, since bathing was a family ritual for us and we rarely ate garlic. 
We did eat plenty of onions, green onions, raw, the bulbs too, from inside out. The tender inside layers are mild and juicy. I didn't tell anyone at school about that. Two, the doorbell rings. Johanna is coming up the stairs carrying a big paper bag. She's out of breath. Why didn't you take the elevator? I take the bag from her. That always takes too long. She slips off her shoes, washes her hands in the sink, and unpacks the groceries. She brought, bought arugula, lettuce and mushrooms, salad dressing croutons, and small mozzarella balls in a plastic tub. I still have to make the salad. I was at the office until just now. Just three of us came in today. She apologizes for the store-bought salad dressing and prepackaged croutons. We can leave out the mozzarella if you don't like it. Of course, Johanna is capable of making a salad. The way I fuss over the meal must be intimidating for her. I lift the lid off of the pot, give it a stir, turn down the heat, then dice onions and, rinsing off the cutting board in between, snip dill and slice a lemon. Three pots on the stove at once and bread in the oven too. How should she know I'm only acting like I have everything under control? That the lentils really have to be soft before it can add the onions. I forgot the foam on the lentils. As soon as the lentils boil, you have to carefully skim off the foam, my mother always said, as she spooned the gray foam out of the pot. How I hated standing next to her by the stove. Watch and learn. I didn't want to learn. I wasn't interested in how you make soup because I wasn't going to be a woman who greeted her husband with dinner waiting on the table. None of my friends had to stay by their mothers and learn how to cook. It's only because I'm a girl. It's only because we're Turkish. Don't be ridiculous. What does that have to do with anything? Do you want to survive on noodles and fish sticks for the rest of your life? Everyone has to learn to cook. Are you listening to the radio? Asks Johanna and goes over to it. A story is playing about balcony plants and what time of day you should water them. But the news will be on soon and we'll learn that integration has failed like we did on the five o'clock news and the week before, and from the very beginning, in fact. I push past her and turn it off. You don't have to turn it off, I only wanted to turn it down. No, I only had it on to distract me. From what? From cooking. Why didn't I just make spaghetti? Canned tomatoes, onions, and garlic. They could have cooked as long as needed until the guests arrived. There's a big piece of Parmesan in the refrigerator, and basil is growing by the bushel on the balcony. I like to make a lot of work for myself. I should, have spared myself my, I should have spared myself the effort, if only for Johanna's sake. Now she's standing at the kitchen counter thinking she has to make the perfect salad to go with my perfect meal. My mother cooked every evening, and plenty. There had to be at least enough food for the next day, for lunch and for dinner. When the green beans and rice in the pots had cool, she filled two generous portions in tin lunch pails with covers that glowed blue. At six in the morning, the pails and a thermos of Nescafe went in the basket that my parents took with them to work. For my mother, cooking in large amounts was a habit. She had five siblings and my father four. To this day, my father brings home a full trunk of groceries from the farmer's market. And when in doubt, my mother always chooses the bigger pot, even for just the two of them. It doesn't mean she wants to impress anyone though, or that she does it to be praised. She cooks because it's good to have a warm meal on the stove. And you never know if someone might drop by unexpectedly. At my friend's house, a cold supper, Vespa, was always served. Bread, cheese, cold cuts, cocktail pickles, apple juice or peppermint tea for the children, mineral water for mom, and a beer for dad. Nobody cooked in the evening except us, and I would have preferred to eat Vespa as well. Then I wouldn't have had to worry if I smelled like food. But my mother always insisted on a proper dinner. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Duncan. And oh, I kind of want, I wish I kind of wish you would keep going. But um, there's a lot in this initial section that we can that we can talk about. So um, I think I'd like to dive right in, uh, going with um, that toward the the end of that section you mentioned Vesper, and you sort of gloss it in the English, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wonder if you would like to say a few more words about issues like that because so we have recurring themes of food um, as a you know cultural marker um, food and the sense that smells and scents that come with food um, but also uh, just the you know the marker of the the rituals that we have around it um, mm -hmm. and and also the you know 
washing her hands when she gets there as she prepares the meal. Um, is, would you like to unpack that for us? Did you have any more thoughts about it or? Um, yeah. In yeah, terms. so so broadly, uh, the kitchen and bathroom are really the two, two spaces where this first passage in particular, uh, but they're important throughout the novel as well. Uh, representing, of course, right, the, the ritual of preparing food and, and for Uslan, the sense that she, she always has to do more, right? Uh, it's, you get a sense of it already in this interaction with Johanna in the part I read, but uh, she's really the only person who likes to cook out of all her friends, and she always feels like, right, that she has to make something more complicated than just spaghetti, and as we saw in this example. Right? And then, of course, there's the scents that come with this, going back to the childhood, eating onions, and, and the stereotype that, that, that Turkish people eat a lot of garlic and smell like garlic, that, that has shaped your identity in a very fundamental way. And so then, uh, later on in this first section, uh, she has another childhood memory of, of being scrubbed off with the kese, which is, uh, it's, it's in the text, it's described as being made out of some synthetic kind of silk, I think is the word she used, but also uh, it's, it's like a, a loofah uh, scrubbing sponge or whatever it's called in English, uh, right? And so every Friday, the, the mother scrubs her off and, uh, right, this is, this is an important memory for her because then she has a, a friend who comes over and she's embarrassed to, to, right, because when you scrub, like, this dead skin comes off, and the mother says, you know, this is, look how filthy you were, and she doesn't want to be described this way, of course, in front of her friend. So these, these two spaces are very important, but to go back to the, the Vespa thing, so uh, in, my re in my remarks before reading, I, I talked about how it's actually not really the, the, the explicitly Turkish things that were challenging here, and so for a German reader, although Vespa is a regional term uh, from, from the Swabian region of Germany, but it's my sense of the text was that it was very understandable uh, for a German reader, or anyone who's familiar with, with Abendbrot, with the idea of, of a cold supper. For English speaking readers, for, for US American readers in particular, I don't think that the gloss in the text was sufficient. And so then I just referred to it as a cold supper. Uh, but this really shows that it's not just the supposedly more foreign Turkish things that, that create problems, right? It's, there's also uh, a number of, of specific, Germany specific references throughout the text that, uh, in the case of translated into English, really uh, call for more careful attention. Uh, there's, there's a scene then later where uh, she, she returns to, to having Vespa with uh, her friend's family and they have their own rituals, right? Table manners are very important for them. It's not so much about the food as how you eat it, uh, how much of it you eat. And so this was also uh, a passage where it was important to, to, to convey a sense of how it would appear to a child who's not familiar with this, right? That it's very, the, the, the idea that they're being very strict and a little bit strange, right? Like for her, the idea that you don't put your elbows on the table or, or you have to have bread together with, with the, the meat is, is a little bit foreign. And so it was really these moments of, of German culture that I found uh, called for more attention than, than the, the quote unquote Turkish uh, moments in the text. Mm -hmm. And I think I have one more question and then I definitely, I know Tess has some excellent observations to make as well. Um, apropos of, you know, the, some of the, the German cultural issues maybe being, uh, you know, presenting different challenges than necessarily the Turkish ones. I'd like to ask you about um, the, the English in the text. And to me, it's, it's the next paragraph after where you cut off your excerpt. But I, I, it, it jumped out to my mind because the, the book's title is I Am Uslam, right? This is, you know, she's asserting herself who she is. Um, so many issues in even this passage, but uh, the rest of the text have to do with um, generational divides, um, the roles of women and all of these things. But she, she goes back to when she was in, you know, also on the school bus, but um, in English class in school. 
and um, you know, mentioning some some students who taunted her. And it comes out that um, you know, Stefan was Steve, Eva could be Eve. There was nothing that fit Islam, so she became Nancy. Um, and that to me just, I kind of laughed out loud and I was also devastated by it. Um, this is such a complete, you mentioned, I, I really like what you had to say before you read your excerpt about the idea of being an intimate outsider, but also um, these, these forms of secrets um, and, and things that uh, operating between cultures um, that, that people either feel a need to deny or suppress um, simply as a, as a way of managing this intercultural mediation. Um, and it's just, to me, it's, it's amazing that Islam became Nancy. Um, and, and not just that she took Nancy, and this was actually something that jumped out to me because different um, translators treated it different ways, um, but the teacher had suggested Nancy. Um, her, the, the, the school English teacher. So I don't know if you had any um, thoughts or reflections on that um, and how that sort of set up the rest of the book. Um, but it, it struck me as very interesting and curious. Yeah, it's definitely an interesting moment of bringing in another uh, cultural sphere and, and uh, right, it's the teacher approaches it and the classmates and Uslam herself in such a way that she somehow doesn't fit right that that um, you know that nancy is, is a second best solution in her case uh, but i i really read this in connection with the cleanliness and especially the scrubbing scene i alluded to uh, with regard to the previous question where right the idea that something needs to be erased or or covered over in some ways you know it, it could be the sense she thinks she has that are associated with Turkishness by others, or in this case, even her name, right, can't just stand on its own. There needs to be, uh, right, that there's extra attention called to her in a way that isn't called to attention of the other students, right? That that, uh, and that, that right, she's marked as an outsider. Sorry, that ties in with the um, with racial, cultural, ethnic slurs, which are always a flashpoint um, and require um, usually more nuance and explanation than is worth working into the, into the translation. So Duncan, what you were saying about the need for erasure or secrets or hiding is, is very evident in um, one of the names she's called, and that's Kümmeltürke, which Kümmel is, strictly speaking, caraway, but cumin is often, it sort of, it encompasses cumin, which technically is Kreuzkümmel, and then caraway is cumin, but because Kreuzkümmel Türke wouldn't be the catchy slur or whatever, concise slur that it is, there's a certain amount of laziness among the Germans, but it's a particularly pointed laziness because caraway which would be the literal translation, is used much more often in German cuisine and doesn't leave the smell that cumin does. And so there's a whole lot of um, erasure and disregard um, on top, layered into that insult, which cannot be caught in an English translation. And so I thought that your translation, which was sort of by sort of, you took a detour, um, was actually very, worked particularly well. So instead of calling, instead of using caraway Turk or cumin Turk or, you know, dirt, or you, you know, whatever, you use dirty Turk, which caught the, along with the garlic in the next, you know, immediate following, it got the concern about these um, different norms. What sort of, you know, what are you worried about standing out with, whether it's the smell of your cuisine or, the fact that you eat more garlic or whatever. And because there's the scene at the end with the bathtub, that racial slur became something that would be immediate and effective in English, um, whereas a spice reference wouldn't. And so you could say that was taking liberties, but in taking liberties, you were truer to the original, I think. Um, and so that was, in the many entries, that was, I think, the most elegant solution because it addressed all these, um, you know, subcutaneous, so to speak, issues at the same time. 
yeah i mean also the the that passage was you know it took me a while to to make this realization uh, and i think it sounds like i took a similar approach to a lot of the other translators initially of just trying to find a substitute slur uh which is not just unsatisfying but really a problematic solution i think and so being able to to make this connection with the importance of cleanliness in bathing is really uh i'm glad it came to me because uh, you know it, it i can't imagine it being quite as, as effective otherwise but i think this this issue ties in really well with a few things that you said earlier in your introductory remarks um, where you talked about you presented translators and is not merely mediators but actually existing in different worlds um, simultaneously or consecutively um, and the, the reason I like that description better than mediators, um, especially in light of our current situation, is that the question is very much whose stories and whose voices are heard. Now, translation enables different stories to be heard, but this text is so relevant precisely because it's giving voice to an experience um, of Turkish immigrants, first and second generation in Germany that, that has been ignored that has been treated as uninteresting or irrelevant. Um, and bringing that then into English and showing that, you know, the discrimination against immigrants and their cultures has all sorts of nuances and comes in many shapes and sizes and flavors, unfortunately. Um, translation, you know, in, in the translation community, we often talk about translation as activism feeling powerless that we can't do more as translators. But here's one way, I think, that translation can expand people's understandings, not just of different languages and traditions, but also the experience of the intimate outsider and the rejected outsider. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, um, I mean, this was a very, uh, from my perspective, it was it was fortuitous that this text was chosen. But obviously, I think uh, in choosing it, right, every, the, the, this, these issues were were obviously in play. And uh, yeah, it's it's. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to to bring up um, something that you alluded to. Um, I've been to a couple academic conferences of the German Studies Association um, and the Austrians. And there is a growing interest in German language literature written by, um, you know, writers where, for whom it's not their first language or mother tongue or home tongue or, you know, whichever term of art is most appropriate. And they call this the Eastern Turn because um, after the wall fell, after 1989, there was a huge influx of Eastern European immigrants. And the first generation didn't really have the time, the wherewithal, or the linguist sophistic linguistic sophistication to write their stories, but their children have, even though they were, maybe they came as children or maybe they were raised in a, you know, uh, home that spoke a different language than German, and they've really enriched the German language. Um, I know uh, Alta, you've translated the um, book by Dana Grigorcha, who brings a sort of a Romanian flavor to German. Um, I've translated a couple such writers, whether they're bringing, coming from a Russian-speaking background, Hungarian, um, Slovenian, and the way they filter that, ex that or bring those overtones and undertones is um, immensely challenging to catch in English. But it's a real phenomenon. And I mean, it's, you can look at any language today or for, you know, across history and see where that plays out. English wouldn't be English without the, English wouldn't be as rich a language as it is today without the Norman conquest. And we, you know, that, Enrichment was forced on English language speakers, but you know it vastly increased the scope and flexibility and keyboard. Hello. 
Hello, I, this is uh, the author, uh, Dilek Gungor, who is joining us uh, from Germany. Uh, I just added her to the discussion. So welcome, Dilek, good to see you. Hello, nice to see you. Thank you very much for having me and having us all together. Welcome, how does it feel? <laughs> it is really touching. Duncan, thank you very much. I was a bit scared at the beginning. But then I thought, it's Aslam just in another dress. I mean, I think it's a real, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a work by, it's, I mean, you create a, a, a text which stands for itself. The translation is a, is a new text, in my opinion. It's a new work of art. But still, I could just listen to your English version and go through it sentence by sentence through the text in my head. So it's something that can stand by itself and still it's very close to to what i what i remember from from writing thank you very much and you're welcome thank you for for joining us and it's good to hear that that uh to get the approval of the author of course and, and what i've done with it but uh yeah it was really as i said uh you know not just this work but but uh, mm -hmm. uh, was really an important text in my development so it was it was fulfilling to have the chance to come back to your work and, and be able to, to do something uh, productive with it. Excellent. And do you like, is this your first time being translated into English? Uh, I have been invited to the University of Ath no, to Georgia in Athens. No, otherwise to Athens in Georgia, like mm -hmm. 10 years ago, or even you know, further back. And uh, there was a German class and I had my columns, a collection of columns then. And I think some of the columns had been translated by one of the students, but it's, um, it has not been published. Mm -hmm. I sincerely, uh, I have no idea who's attending this today. I hope maybe someone with editorial clout at a US publisher is attending. That's sort of one of the goals of this prize is, um, you know, it's, it's a whole other theme to talk about another, for another day, um, how little literature from other countries yeah. makes it into English in the US. But um, this was a, a very, very exciting excerpt for me to read. So. I think uh, I have a lot more I could say. Dean, did we have questions from the audience to take? Uh, yes, we do. We have uh, one question from Zach Sewer, uh, who wrote in. So let me uh, unmute you, Zach. You there, Zach? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Yeah, this is Zach Sewer. Um, also just sort of a young aspiring translator. Um, Welcome. My, my interest is in um, how you make decisions about when to include a word from the original language in your translation and what the stakes are um, of that decision. So in your translation that you read, you used the word Vespa, which was in the original, but then you added some commentary. Um, I just wondered if any of you could talk a little bit more about how you make that decision um, whether it's um, a, a concept like that that doesn't translate neatly or a, a brand name, maybe. Thanks. Duncan, do you have yeah. thoughts about that? So for, in the case of Vespa, I think because it's a regionalism, uh -huh. I mean, there's, there's a good reason not to, to translate it, right? That it wouldn't necessarily be legible to every German reader either uh, to think about it in practical terms. But there's another moment uh, where she refers to some things by the brand name. So it's uh, Nivea, I think, and Parasol I'm blanking on the other one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so those I just, I uh, rendered as, I, I took it as, as a metonymy for, for the product uh, that's sold under that name. And, and Nivea I'm familiar with, but there was a question of, uh, where is, I'm not sure if it's, that's on the American market or not, if it's something from, from Germany or Turkey that I picked up there. So I, I just made the decision to, to 
gloss those as as the the, the product they represent as, as skin cream and, and lip balm um, in the text. So in that case, I think it's it's about striking a balance between legibility and what what these uh, terms are doing in the original, right? So uh, either marking a particular region uh, in the case of Vespa or standing in for some kind of consumer product, which would be very clear to the reader. And so in this case, it's, I made the decision to make it clear to the English language reader, but it would be interesting to hear about, uh, because there's a wide variety of examples of things like this in various texts. So I would be interested to, to see what, what Alta and, and Tessa's experience has been as well with these kind of issues. Um, in this particular uh, case for this prize, it was interesting to see how um, how the translators dealt with these issues of recognizability. Almost all of them included the brand name and then a gloss. So no one just left it as the, as the um, you know, the, the brand name, however recognizable. Um, but, you know, that's a, there's a, there's a joke. Um, how many translators does it take to change a light bulb? It depends on the context. Um, and so it, it sort of, you know, if the brand name is making a statement, um, if there's a particular pointedness or, or weight it's bringing, you know, whether it's maybe it's, you know, like say Aunt Jemima, that has a, that has all sorts of baggage and overtones and you would, you know, that's a conscious decision and glossing over it and eliminating it would be a disservice. But if it's just a standard, I mean, maybe the laundry detergent brand is important because of the particular smell, but in that case, someone, or there was um, shower gel, one of the people just said orange scented shower gel, but left off the brand name. So I think, um, I think the best answer I can give is, well, it depends. <laughs> I think it always depends. And this is where each work tells you how to work it. Um, I think there's, the, um, I, I, I know that the Goethe Institute has, you know, a, a, a high level of, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, very well-read folks, but I think, you know, in when I think about talking to my certain family members who are not necessarily in the world of literature or uh, operating between languages, there can be this, uh, notion that translation is carrying meaning from one container in this word into the this meaning in this other word in this other language and um, wouldn't that be amazing and easy and lovely but it's never that simple and uh, you know there are always these um, these points to navigate so one of the things that came up in my work with Donna Grigorch's novel and and she's particularly bringing her um, her background of having been born and grown up in Romania, but then studied in Austria and Germany before settling in Switzerland, is that she used the word zigoina and zigonerin. And, um, you know, so these are, it marks it in a specific place and time. Um, sorry, I digress from the product question, but there are, you know, the, the products do come up and, uh, you know, sometimes, as Tess said, sometimes it's important and sometimes it's not. Uh, I think another interesting thing that that came up in this and pretty much uh, any translation um, is, uh, you know, in addition to what is important, um, what is important in how much it's it's not necessarily in the text itself, but between the lines or between the words. And I think that's one of the biggest things I've found in terms of just maintaining, um, remaining humble and having a degree of respect and humility as the translator in service of this text, that if it doesn't say something, uh, there might be this instinctual desire to explain it to this other culture or the reader that you're bringing it to. Um, but that is often a disservice to what has um, intentionally not been explicitly stated in the original. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that test or don't have one thing to add to that. And that is, my views on that have changed um, quite a bit in the last few years, primarily because of Google. And if there's something that can easily be looked up, then I might leave it in. It sort of 
it's a factor. It hasn't changed my decision making process, but it's one more factor I bring to it. And um, I don't, I'd like to leave the reader the option of, of getting more information rather than my shorthand, um, you know, I mean, obviously not for something as, as straightforward as a laundry detergent brand, but um, Google has changed my calculation on that question or in finding those answers. So, uh, Dilek, I'm just wondering if you've ever had experience as a translator uh, or how it might compare to the act of uh, writing independently. I have to admit I was a very intimidated translator and I believed that the solution for every word is in the dictionary, really. And uh, I thought that you can do it like an equation. That's why I was such a bad translator. And um, it took me much, it was much later that I realized what a translation really is and that it's not like one-to-one. -one. But I think if, if uh, a language is, as English is for me, just a, a learned language in school and at university and by being abroad, then you never have this um, confidence and this inner, inner trust that, that you really know what you're translating, I think. I have always been doubting and uh, lacking the, well, the confidence in, in, in my feeling for the other language, since my German was always much stronger. And um, I never worked as a translator, really. I went to the newspaper then after graduating from, from Germersheim. Um, and um, writing is something where you can be completely free but being trained as a translator, I think, trained me for my, my ear for words, for language, for uh, style. And I think I would not have been started, I wouldn't have started writing probably if I had not studied translation. Interesting. Great. Uh, we have one question now from Mary Ann Newman. I've unmuted you, so uh, go ahead. Well, thank you for this wonderful conversation and for this book I'm looking forward to being able to read. Um, I have a question for Dilek and a question for Duncan. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about the reception in, in the German audience of, and, and whether it's been read by other German language speaking countries and if there's any difference in that. And for Duncan, um, I wonder if you're reading immigrant voices in or other, you know, other peoples in, in English language, and if you see any parallels between what you're doing and what you've had to do with what's happening here. Thank you, Marianne. Yeah, it has been perceived very well, really. I was scared, of course, because it was a very, it's a very personal, a very intimate book. But I think since it's told in a very quiet and a very I don't want to say shy, but in a very taken back kind of voice. It's not, I'm not judging anyone. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not naming anyone as a culprit, for example. It's, I'm just trying to describe. And I think this enabled readers, also people who have, ne who have never um, experienced racial discrimination or any kind of discrimination, just to go with the feelings and see parallels that you can feel ashamed, that you can feel intimidated, that you can feel embarrassed by certain things. And just by taking the readers into these situations, um, rather than blaming them, um, it enabled a lot of people just to, to see what I'm talking about. We have these big, big words like, like racism or discrimination. And sometimes they're just so big that they just, they just, I don't know, they just cover our sight. And I think if, you, if we try to describe little situations, it enables everyone just to go into it and have a look at it. I got lots of letters from young or Turkish German readers who said, this is the way it is. That was what encouraged me the most. Having found a voice or a way of telling things that I experienced and see that it has been uh, multiplied by or experienced by so many others. 
that was uh, a really a, a nice feeling. Yeah, so as far as my uh, reading of, of other, uh, other authors, uh, I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm a bit more familiar with German language than, uh, than a lot of the, the, the minority writing in English, although uh, I happen to be reading Zadie Smith uh, right around the time I started working on the translation, so that might have had, uh, I mean, I found it to be a very, a very uh, uh, fortuitous thing to be reading at the same time. The, 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 uh, there were some similarities, and to have her, I mean, her prose is really incredible, so that just from a technical standpoint, I found that to be really helpful. One thing I did notice uh, that about the text that, that speaks a little bit more to the Anglophone context was the use of, of untranslated Turkish. So a lot of my research focuses on earlier uh, writing and not just in, in German necessarily, uh, but there's not a whole lot of, of German Turkish texts that do this the way that uh, I think like Sandra Cisneros would be, would be an example if I'm remembering correctly of using untranslated Spanish or uh, Tim Hernandez is another uh, Chicano writer who, who uses this technique. So there, there was, uh, I found some resonance, but uh, I'm not sure, you know, subconsciously, I'm, I'm sure it had some impact on the translation process, but I can't say that I was, was, was really uh, strongly drawing on that, but it's a good question. It's, 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 uh, there's, there's definitely uh, more to be said about that, but it's maybe my own limits that, uh, you know, keep me from, from fully making the, the connections that can be made. Mm -hmm. Marianne, thank you so much for that excellent question. Um, so in the interest of just noticing that we're running short on time, I do, uh, my, my final thought, and then maybe Tess will have a final reflection, that little moment where they're preparing the meal and cooking and listening to the radio and no, you don't have to turn the radio off, just turn it down. But that snippet in the news where it says, you know, that we're going to learn, like we learned earlier, that integration has failed. And that's, that just jumped out to me today. Um, there, that, that's three words in this excerpt, in this passage, in this entire book. And they're right in the front. And it just, it, it's, I don't even, I don't even have words um, for it. But to me, that was just, um, it's, it's such a, it speaks to the power of literature. Um, and I guess what I want to, I mention it because, man, it, it feels like, you know, we're having this conversation again, sort of starting to have it in a new way in the United States. And Germany is as well. And both of our cultures um, have had lots of blind spots, but also intentionally avoided talking about certain things. And it is Sincerely, my hope that not only will integration not fail, but um, that translation and that people who operate and exist, uh, you know, in multiple languages and cultures can help bring us together rather than apart. Well, I, yeah, I take hope in the, I mean, there's so many grounds for despair and including this continuing conversation with whatever very country variation or racial or ethnic or whatever variation that we've been having and having and having. But looking at the New York Times bestseller list and seeing how the, it has flipped um, from probably, you know, 90% white week after week to primarily African American writers. Um, now, that said, in the nonfiction, but to me, it shows that finally, the conversation is not just being had, but it's being listened to by more than the usual suspects. And so that, that's, you know, my one ray of hope. Not my one ray of hope, but one of the few rays of hope that I've seen these days. Uh, it's about four o'clock now, 10 p.m. in uh, Germany. But, but Dilek, if you want to also uh, add anything before we end, uh, and then Duncan. Uh, 
uh, by all means. Yeah, thank you very much. I was really, I really liked your translation, Duncan. And uh, it's, 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 yeah. Yeah, as I said before, even also that it's also kind of a, a, a tense or exciting moment to to hear your own text in another language, and also through someone else's brain. But all your remarks, Alta and Tess, you made like um, what you read between the lines, just made me aware that what I've done, like when you say like all this washing and this cooking in the kitchen and the bathroom, and then I say, yeah, that's right. Because while you write it, you don't realize that you put it that way. You just, it makes sense in the process of writing. And afterwards someone says, look, this is the same motive or the same, I don't know what. And then it makes, it, beca it becomes, it gets a structure all of a sudden. So thank you very much for making me aware of that. Duncan? Well, it's, it's uh, like I said, it, it's an honor to receive this award and uh, I'm glad that everyone could be here today, especially uh, to hear your kind words, Dilek. Like. It's really uh, encouraging and, and, and I'm glad that, that I was able to, to find that right wavelength and, and create a relatively successful translation from it. So thank you to everyone. And, and well, uh, thank you so much to all four of you for joining us and for this really important and uh, relevant conversation uh, and one which uh, hopefully has helped uh, amplify voices and, and to lead to a, a continued discussion. Uh, and I'd like to also thank uh, our audience, all of you for tuning in from all around the world for your interesting questions and for being a part of today's conversation. So thank you everyone, stay healthy and safe, and uh, we hope to see you very soon. Take care, bye-bye.